From April 2015 through March 2018, Trevor Heitman, also known as McSkillet, became one of CSGO's most notorious YouTubers. With almost 1 million subscribers and earnings of over $4 million in just 10 months, it seemed like there were no limits to his success. However, a significant change in the online gambling scene and a sudden deterioration in his mental health would lead to Trevor's downfall, transforming McSkillet from a celebrated CSGO influencer to one of its most reviled figures. Welcome back to True Crime Inspector, and in today's video, we're delving into the case of McSkillet. We regularly cover solved, unsolved, and strange cases, so if you're interested, please consider subscribing. With that said, let's delve into today's story. Grab a drink, take a seat, and let's explore the case of McSkillet. San Diego, California serves as our backdrop. Located in the southwestern corner of the United States, this coastal city boasts a warm climate, stunning beaches, beautiful parks, and fantastic cuisine. It's in the tranquil suburb of Carmel Valley that we find the Heitman family. Our focus in this story is on their son, Trevor Heitman. Trevor, known online as Baby McSkillet, was born on February 18, 2000. Growing up with his sister, he was the child of Kurt Heitman and mother Beta Heitman. While we don't have extensive details about Trevor's early childhood, his family described him as a quiet, well-mannered, and upstanding individual. Despite his towering stature, Trevor was a reserved individual. During his formative years, he attended La Joa Country Day School. He had a fondness for basketball, and though he never reached varsity level, he received numerous awards in the novice bracket. Looking back at Google Street View, you can even spot the basketball hoop in his driveway. However, as we approach the year 2015, this basketball hoop would vanish. By the time Trevor entered his mid-teens, his interest shifted towards video games, and his basketball games outside with friends became a thing of the past. However, Trevor was gaining popularity in other realms. Using the online moniker McSkillet, he immersed himself in Counter-Strike, Global Offensive, commonly known as CSGO. CSGO is a typical first-person shooter game, but what drew Trevor to it was its skin feature. This aspect is crucial to understanding the case. Skins are essentially cosmetic designs for weapons within the game. They don't enhance your gameplay, they're purely for visual customization. However, you could collect and trade these skins with other players. While most of these skins were common, some were exceedingly rare. This rarity created a financial ecosystem within CSGO. In April 2015, Trevor, under the alias McSkillet, uploaded his first video to YouTube titled Top 10 Most Expensive Skins in CSGO. What's going on everyone? This is McSkillet here and today I'm going to be showing you guys the top 10 most expensive and most rare skins for CSGO. And this list might not, it might not be 100% accurate just because there's so many different variations for some of these knives, but I tried to make the most accurate list I could. So without further ado, the top 10 most expensive and most rare skins for CSGO. Trevor was undeniably a brilliant young man. The type of video content he produced was virtually non-existent on YouTube at the time. While many people were interested in rare skins, the process of finding the best ones was laborious and required extensive manual research. Trevor's YouTube channel filled a significant gap in the market. There was a high demand for his content, with very few content creators catering to it. Trevor also possessed strong analytical skills, and his amiable personality further endeared him to his audience. Collaborations with others in the CSGO community only boosted his popularity, leading to almost 1 million subscribers. As the CSGO community grew, so did McSkillet. Skins became an integral part of the game's ecosystem, benefiting him immensely. This led to skin trading and, more significantly, gambling. CSGO players could spend money to purchase loot boxes or packages that contained random skins, some of which were rare and highly valuable. At the age of 16, McSkillet began receiving sponsorships from CSGO gambling sites like CSGO Wild and CSGO Strong. 
With his increasing notoriety, the payments from these sponsorships grew substantially. In 2017, he elevated his business ventures further. Instead of merely being sponsored by CSGO gambling sites, he decided to create his own. By November 2017, he had launched his third and final website, CSGO Magic. McSkillet effectively redirected a substantial amount of traffic from his YouTube channel to his website, resulting in substantial earnings. It is estimated that from April 2015 to December 2017, he had earned over $10 million through his various ventures, with approximately $4 million in the most recent 10 months alone. In December 2017, McSkillet showcased his new acquisition, a McLaren 650S. And it beats just about every single other supercar in a drag race. And I'm not, not talking about like hypercars like Porsche 19 Spider, but when we're talking about like even like a Lamborghini Aventador, uh, Huracan, any, any of the Ferraris, it beats all of those. Um, they actually have a new McLaren, the 720S, which I don't think too many people have yet. And at the time I bought mine, I don't even know if it was announced yet. But uh, yeah, this car is pretty damn insane. It's got a twin turbo V8. So once the turbos kick in, you just have so much power, it's ridiculous. And if you're wondering how I was able to afford this car, well, at the time I bought it, my sources of income were just uh, Skin.Trade, I owned that site, and then sponsored CSGO gambling videos and some other sponsorships of like Gameflip, but it was mainly Skin.Trade because that's what I used to make a ton, and then I did make a pretty good amount from gambling sponsorships. During those two and a half years, McSkillet had risen to become one of the most prominent figures in the world of CSGO. He had built a massive community, established multiple successful businesses, and accumulated substantial wealth. Trevor also maintained his physical fitness by working with a personal trainer at Crunch Fitness, as evident in a photo taken at the gym. On March 20th, 2018, unbeknownst to Trevor at the time, he posted his final video on YouTube. The video did not contain any special significance or hint at the impending catastrophe. However, his career was about to come to a sudden halt. McSkillet's rise coincided with the loot box controversy, in which gambling and video games was causing concerns among both children and adults worldwide. On March 29, 2018, Valve updated its CSGO game guidelines to address skin gambling sites. This ultimately led to the demise of McSkillet's own website, CSGO Magic. Under the new guidelines, players could still trade skins, but they were subjected to a seven-day cooldown period. In addition to these measures, McSkillet's personal inventory was banned due to his association with gambling bots. With a personal inventory worth over $100,000 and his once thriving business empire now facing a grim future, McSkillet saw little hope for his future endeavors. While he could potentially restart or explore new opportunities with his 900,000 subscribers, it would require significant time and effort. Ultimately, McSkillet felt defeated and began to fade into obscurity. He retired from the CSGO skin community, even indicating this in his Twitter bio. Despite still having substantial wealth and a large community, McSkillet appeared to lose his sense of purpose and usual income stream. He briefly mentioned a few new projects in the following months, but largely faded from the public eye. Given Trevor's private nature, little is known about his personal life during this time. However, only a few months later, Trevor returned to the spotlight for an entirely different reason. On August 18th, his behavior underwent a noticeable change. He informed his parents that he believed he was experiencing a mental breakdown and began acting erratically and recklessly. He even confessed to driving his McLaren at 150 miles per hour in a 25 miles per hour zone in the wrong direction, expressing a belief that neither the police nor their bullets could harm him. These concerns escalated when Trevor later broke down in front of his parents, claiming once again that he was experiencing a breakdown and his condition did not improve. Just five days later, on August 23rd at approximately 8.30 a.m., a neighbor and family friend named Mary Rusher, who was a board-certified psychiatrist with substantial experience, urgently called 911 due to concerns about Trevor's mental health. Hello, 911. I'm calling to report an emergency. 
I believe there's an individual who is a danger to himself and a danger to others. I do believe that he is suffering from a mental illness and that he should be detained on a 5150 for further observation. Twelve minutes after Mary Rusher's phone call, police officers arrived at the Heitman residence. Trevor's parents were anxiously waiting to speak to them, concerned about their son's deteriorating mental state. He's got manic behavior. He's never been diagnosed with I, He needs to go into a doctor. But he should be held on the 5150. How is that? Let me ask you, are you his psychiatrist? I am not. Have you ever seen him? I have not. In any professional setting? Trevor's parents remained deeply concerned about their son's behavior. The, 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 the police don't want to create a violent encounter and get him in trouble. Trevor, who was currently asleep in his bedroom, was clearly under some form of mental relapse. He had been screaming at his parents throughout the morning, and while making paranoid and delusional statements, he had even threatened to harm his mother. Beta described the behavior of an extremely delusional man, and some of those details which he shared with officers were very concerning. Trevor believed that if he traveled at a high enough speed and in the opposite direction, he would be able to drive his McLaren through any other vehicle without any incident. This notion is deeply unsettling. McSkillet had a profound passion for CSGO, and as any gamer knows, there's a concept known as clipping in video games where characters can pass through solid objects. This raises the question of whether Trevor might have blurred the lines between game mechanics and reality. Furthermore, Trevor also asserted that his sister was present in the room, stalking him when, in actuality, she was not even on the premises. Regrettably, the San Diego Police Department found themselves in a situation where they believed they lacked the authority to apprehend Trevor, as he had not committed any apparent legal infractions. In their body cam footage, Trevor's McLaren was visible in the garage, with Kurt strategically parking his rented SUV across the driveway to prevent Trevor's McLaren from leaving. This precautionary measure became a focal point of contention during the ensuing discussion involving the officers, Trevor's parents, and Dr. Rusher. Legal records shed light on the fact that the family implored the officers to invoke their pert duties, also known as the Psychiatric Emergency Response Team. These duties encompass conducting an evaluation of an individual grappling with a mental health crisis and, when deemed suitable, initiating a referral or facilitating transport to a treatment facility. In response, the officers inquired if Dr. Rusher served as Trevor's attending physician. Dr. Rusher clarified that she was a family friend and not Trevor's primary healthcare provider. However, she underscored in her capacity as a board-certified psychiatrist that Trevor's mental condition warranted his detention under a Section 5150 hold. Under Californian Welfare and Institution Code 5150, this provision empowers authorities to involuntarily detain an adult in the throes of a mental health crisis for a 72-hour psychiatric hospitalization. This course of action, of course, hinges on whether individuals are assessed, for instance, by the Psychiatric Emergency Response Team, PERT, and found to pose a threat to themselves, others, or be in a state of severe disability. Despite the group's justified pleas for assistance and the professional insights provided by Dr. Rusher, the officers remained steadfast in their decision not to enter the residence for an evaluation. Instead of carrying out these prescribed duties, they advised Beta that her only recourse was to refrain from entering her own home until she could initiate a formal eviction process against Trevor by filing a civil restraining order. The officers explained that this legal procedure would typically span around a month. In accordance with this, Kurt and Dr. Rusher proceeded to enter Trevor's bedroom. However, Trevor's demeanor took a sudden turn as he began to scream at Dr. Rusher, his mouth wide agape emitting incomprehensible noises while launching into a tirade of insults directed at her. Once again, the officers cited their inability to conduct pert duties or detain Trevor, emphasizing that he had not committed any confirmed criminal acts at that time. Recognizing that their intervention was unlikely, the Heidemann family expressed gratitude to the officers for their time and permitted them to depart. In a gesture of goodwill, 
Kurt informed the officers that he would take his son to the hospital later that day, and it appeared that Trevor had concurred with this plan. The officers acknowledged this and eventually left without further action. Tragically, due to the absence of intervention from the officers or any other individuals, this would ultimately lead to devastating consequences. Around 4.15 p.m., Trevor Heidemann abruptly emerged from his bedroom, informing his parents that he had to leave. Without a moment for his parents to respond, he swiftly assumed control of his McLaren and forcefully collided with his father's SUV to make his escape from the driveway. Just a mere few minutes later, at roughly 4.23 p.m., he plowed his McLaren through the fence surrounding Ashley Falls Elementary School. Once within the premises, he drove recklessly in and around the school's parking lot. Trevor is then purported to have exited his vehicle, breaking a window, before returning to his car, where he was confronted by school staff. Fortunately, owing to the time of year, the school was not in session. Nonetheless, children could be observed fleeing in an attempt to distance themselves from his vehicle. Subsequently, Trevor forcefully exited the school grounds. By 4.30 p.m., Trevor had reached the southbound I-5 freeway, where he became embroiled in a hit-and-run incident. While no one suffered severe injuries during this incident, it left many individuals deeply shaken. At 4.31 p.m., the police dispatch logs confirmed a 911 call from Trevor's father, Kurt. In the call, he stated that Trevor was in a frenzied state, had collided with their vehicles, and fled the property. Kurt reiterated the urgent need for Trevor to receive substantial assistance. A mere six minutes later, at approximately 4.35 p.m., Kurt's apprehensions materialized into a harrowing reality as Trevor Heidemann proceeded to travel in the wrong direction, ascending an exit ramp from the 805 freeway. Because of its elevated position, oncoming traffic had no visibility of Trevor's McLaren, and as he accelerated to speeds exceeding 100 miles per hour in his sports car, even a slight misjudgment would have dire consequences. Approaching Junction 27A, he continued to surge past incoming traffic at speeds well in excess of 100 miles per hour, with the inherent risks being both substantial and perilous. However, his ill-fated journey would be cut tragically short. At precisely 4.36 p.m., Trevor's McLaren collided head-on with a Hyundai SUV. The impact was of such colossal magnitude that it claimed Trevor's life instantaneously. The sheer force of the collision caused his torso to be severed by a seatbelt and various body parts were ejected onto the freeway. Unfortunately, this tragic story takes an even darker turn. The Hyundai SUV involved in the collision carried two passengers, both of whom became unwitting victims of Trevor's actions. Among them was a devoted 43-year-old mother named Eileen Pizarro, who was accompanied by her 12-year-old daughter. Eileen hailed from a background steeped in love and nurturing. She was a family therapist, dedicated to offering support and guidance to previously abused children. Her son described her as a selfless mother who always placed her family's needs above her own. At the time of her untimely demise, she was in the process of pursuing licensure as a therapist. An important detail to note for later is her deep admiration for Dwayne Johnson. Tragically, Eileen leaves behind two sons. In the passenger seat, her 12-year-old daughter, Ariana, was the youngest to lose her life in this devastating incident. Born in the year 2006, she was just a few days shy of embarking on her journey into the seventh grade. Ariana was a self-proclaimed whiz kid, harboring a deep love for reading, music, and above all else, singing. Frequently, she would lend her voice to small community gatherings in Santa Monica, whether in duets with her brothers or solo performances. Her melodious voice resonated throughout the local community, but tragically, it would no longer grace their ears. Notably, Trevor's autopsy report revealed the absence of drugs or alcohol in his system at the time of his demise. Furthermore, there was no medical history of depression, no indicators of suicidal thoughts or prior attempts, and no documented diagnosis of mental illness. 
Trevor adhered to a straight-edge lifestyle, abstaining from smoking, illegal substances, and alcohol. Moreover, no suicide note was discovered. Initially, investigators examining this case were confounded by his actions. There appeared to be no discernible motive or aggravating factor at the outset, sparking widespread speculation. As the news of McSkillet's demise and the tragic loss of two lives with him spread, public sentiment regarding his actions quickly ignited and became polarized. Indeed, McSkillet found himself vilified by a multitude of individuals. Thousands upon thousands of comments strewn across his videos branded him as a selfish murderer who should have quietly taken his own life. However, delving beyond the surface and examining court records unveils an entirely different dimension to his motives. Contrary to seeking help for suicidal tendencies, Trevor Heitman was grappling with a profound mental breakdown, as evidenced by his appeals to his parents. His final actions seemed to mirror his earlier delusional beliefs. Trevor did not appear to harbor a desire for self-destruction. Rather, he seemed to genuinely believe that he could pass through other vehicles without any adverse consequences, influenced by his prior delusions. Despite the collapse of his business empire, Trevor remained a level-headed individual with substantial financial resources to potentially embark on a fresh start. Ultimately, we cannot definitively ascertain his thoughts, but nothing in the available evidence suggests a desire to end his own life. In fact, the medical examiner's report hinted at the possibility that he may have been grappling with mania, a condition also informally diagnosed by his board-certified neighbor. Mania is a psychological condition characterized by irrational euphoria, extreme mood swings, hyperactivity, and delusions. Individuals experiencing mania are at a heightened risk of hallucinations and other perceptual disturbances, which may lead to engagement in riskier behaviors. It's highly plausible that Trevor Heitman, or McSkillet, was experiencing this mental state. Mania can be triggered by various factors, including environmental changes such as stressful events, financial pressures, and hormonal or chemical imbalances. McSkillet, at the tender age of 18, was grappling with an immense amount of pressure. He had managed to build a sprawling, multi-million dollar business empire, but now, all of it was unraveling before his very eyes. While navigating the highs of success may have come easily to this diligent and intelligent young man, the overwhelming fear of losing it all would have undoubtedly taken a toll on his relatively inexperienced mind. Anxiety can wield significant influence over one's actions and decisions, and McSkillet was confronted with a monumental downfall. However, it's imperative to stress that his actions remain entirely unjustifiable. Whether the intervention should have stemmed from law enforcement, his parents, or even himself, medical assistance should have been sought much earlier. The true victims of this case are Eileen and Ariana Pizarro, who suffered the dire consequences. Their lives were snatched away in the blink of an eye, without any opportunity for them to make choices or decisions. One moment, it was an ordinary day, and the next, they were gone. Although that moment may not have lasted long, the terror they experienced at the sight of an oncoming vehicle must have been immeasurable. Subsequently, the Pizarro family would forever bear the scars of this tragedy. A loving mother and a gifted daughter leave behind countless unfinished dreams and unfulfilled promises. In the wake of international outrage, Dwayne Johnson, whom Eileen had deeply admired, extended his thoughts and prayers to the Pizarro family. Hey, Angelo, um, Dwayne Johnson here, and uh, I had turned on my phone and I saw a flood, thousands and thousands of, uh, of tweets had come through. And I'm so sorry to hear about your sister and your mom and this tragic loss that you and your family are going through. In the aftermath of their tragic deaths, a series of lawsuits have transformed this case into a legal battleground. San Diego City lays blame on Trevor's parents, asserting that they should have taken action sooner, while Trevor's parents point fingers at the city's police department, alleging that their concerns were not taken seriously enough. The Pizarro family, understandably seeking justice for their irreplaceable loss, has filed lawsuits against both these parties. 
Uncovering the details of this case required extensive research and personal investigation, as much of this information is not readily accessible. In all honesty, it's likely that not many people fully comprehend the complexities of Trevor Heitman's story. Although the media may have delved into the case in the immediate aftermath, the passage of time and the emergence of court documentation have brought greater clarity to McSkillet's situation. While I don't aim to shape your opinion, my hope is that my research can shed more light on a narrative that has largely remained in obscurity. Despite a lack of evidence indicating a reduction in speed or an attempt to steer away from oncoming traffic, Trevor Heitman's case was ultimately classified as an accident. Many individuals argue that this case should, at the very least, be considered as second-degree murder or even manslaughter. It's hard to simply classify it as an accident when there are strong arguments to suggest otherwise. However, the legal standing of this case is challenging due to the lack of concrete evidence demonstrating malicious intent on the part of Mick Skillet. One of the most haunting aspects of this case is the evidence it left behind on Google Maps. While street images prior to the fatal crash showed nothing out of the ordinary, subsequent images reveal a scorched road, a stark scar, and a grim reminder of the nightmarish events involving Trevor Heitman. Even today, you can easily pinpoint the location where three lives were tragically lost. Trevor Heitman's YouTube channel, known as McSkillet, still remains active to this day.